in my presentation, you kind of know who I am and how I got into, you know, building Cozy. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as we've been discussing here, you know, sort of telling the big story about the project, because there's a million little things that people who build Cozies, you know, perseverate about every, every waking minute, but uh, that's not the purpose of tonight for me anyway. It's really to to kind of, uh, you know, share the big story picture and, uh, and hopefully, you know, make it somewhat uh, interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, if I have the green flag, I'll, I'll get right into it. And uh, my goal, you know, I've got a lot of content here because, you know, anybody uh, that's committed as many hours uh, to building an airplane uh, gets, uh, you know, pretty attached to all, all the work that they've done. But I will uh, try to condense this down to maybe uh, 20, 25 minutes at most, hopefully, and uh, or even even quicker. And then uh, if we can, you know, if there's some time for Q and A. Um, I'm happy to talk talk more about the project. Uh, um, but uh, getting right into it, um, I kind of came up with this title with Dan Masses because. Uh, uh, Frankly, I think every experimental uh, build is a, is a unique story. Um, and uh, I don't think mine is any different. Um, and it's got, you know, some things that are, are a little bit different that I'll, I'll get into. But um, uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to do this because uh, uh, I'm having a lot of fun uh, finishing up this airplane and, and I love talking about it. So I appreciate the opportunity. So... Who am I and how, you know, what am I, what am I trying to do with this airplane? Uh, I'm not an engineer. I was a, you know, 35 year healthcare executive. So, although, uh, fortunately for me, my oldest son is an Embry Riddle aerospace engineer grad and he worked five years on the 787 uh, for Boeing uh, as a stability and control engineer. So, uh, he's uh, really good with the math and if I have, uh, <laughs> Aerodynamic questions, uh, I've got him at my fingertips. So uh, my, my build philosophy has always been about not inventing anything because I'm not an engineer and, and uh, I don't have innate engineering, you know, IQ with stuff. So I'm only, I'm only doing things in this airplane that have been done before. And uh, particularly if it has anything to do with, let's say the core systems or aerodynamics. Um, even though I was pretty much a healthcare guy my whole life, I've always been fascinated by how things work and, and, uh, I've always liked to build things. And, and before I got started building the airplane, I was building fine furniture. It's, and that was fairly practical for a family with, with three kids. So, uh, I filled up the house with furniture before I started working, <laughs> working full time on the airplane. <laughs> uh, and, uh, like a lot of guys, I think in my age group, you know, I, I fell in love with space travel first because it, it was all about July 20th, 1969, sitting on the, on, the, on the end of my parents' bed, watching a small black and white TV. And when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, it, it, uh, it literally, I was just one of those kids where it changed me and it changed a lot of my friends. And gosh, you know, we were all quickly getting into rockets and and uh, model airplanes, and then you nope. know, you control airplanes, and the front, et cetera. So uh, that's where kind of my passion uh, came from. Why the cozy? Um, you know, at the time I was looking at building something because I really wanted to build something. Uh, we actually had three kids at the time, so I knew we were already too big for a four seat airplane, but. Uh, you know, I thought it looked cool, and it's uh, it has this uh, it has this uh, anti spin uh, feature because the canard stalls first, and uh, it's a plans build airplane, so it was affordable. And my mission really was always to do cross country. Uh, I'm really kind of a cross country lover. Uh, and, and flying and 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 I think the cozy fit all those fit all those things. Um, in many ways, building a, a fiberglass airplane is like making 
furniture, you know, it's, there's a lot of the similar techniques. I've never done metal and working with foam, shaping foam is like shaping wood. And, and, and of course, when you make anything out of wood, you spend a lot of time sanding and the cozy, <laughs> any, is no different to any composite airplane, you spend a lot of time sanding. And um, the cozy in particular, one of the reasons uh, I settled on it was I was very impressed with Matt Puffer. Um, and I can't, and when I discovered this article in Kip Plains in 1994, of course, Nat, um, Nat is the designer for the cozy and he designed the three place cozy first and then quickly uh, designed the, the four place. Uh, his wife, Shirley, and I know this because I heard this directly from Shirley at Oshkosh, one day told Nat she was not sitting in the back anymore because Nat had built a long EZ. Uh, or, yeah, and, and Shirley, his wife, basically said, Nat, I'm not sitting in the back anymore. <laughs> so Nat decided to build a side-by-side -side version of the long EZ, and, uh, and his first iteration was the three place. But he, he needed to convince Bert Rutan to give him sort of the rights to um, sell the plants for the, the cozy because, you know, 80% of the cozy is based on the long EZ. And uh, so one of the ways that, that Nat uh, worked to try to convince Bert um, to let him do this was to, to really explore uh, the deep stall characteristics of the, of the canard airplane. And, and in, it's one of the things about the canard airplane is if you stall the main wing, you basically become a leaf and you flutter to the ground. So it's very important not to be in an FCG configuration and it's very important not to stall the main wing. So he built this contraption where he put a sliding 135 pound weight uh, in the passenger seat and they and they put the airplane in deep stall and and um, stalled the main wing and then uh, using this motor driven you know trolley they moved the weight forward and got out got out of the stall so just the fact that he was willing to uh, invest the time and energy which is not typical in you know in the experimental world uh, mainly, you know, the designer may say, you know, stay, stay in bounds because we haven't tested it out of bounds and you'll be safe. Nat decided to test the airplane out of bounds. And that, um, you know, that really impressed me. So um, in 1998, I was at AirVenture with my oldest, uh, who was nine years old at the time, met Nat and Shirley and decided to buy the plant. So... I bought the plans in 1998 with, uh, you know, every intention of, of getting started. Uh, a lot of years went by. Uh, so now it's 2015. <laughs> and, you know, my oldest has graduated from college. Uh, and I still hadn't started working on the cozy. Um, so I decided to, to shortcut the process. You know, I, I didn't want to take the time to build the airplane from scratch. And I started looking at cozies that were already built and flying that I thought I could personalize. You know, uh, maybe they just had a simple avionics suite or an engine that had timed out or something. And I began exploring um, cozies that were either flying um, or were out of annual. Um, this cozy came up on eBay, and um, and I kind of it caught my attention uh, just because of all the high end avionics that were in it, um, and immediately on the cozy builders forum, people, you know, started to talk about, um, you know, being such a skeptical <laughs> of an airplane that was put on eBay, so. You know, this particular, this was a flying cozy, it was on eBay, it was being sold by a, you know, a broker. There was an interesting comment from Bill Allen, who's a long time, you know, leader in the canard world, um, you know, 
buying a, buying an airplane on eBay is is useless unless you're just buying it for parts. Um, and another very interesting comment from Tom Darden in our group, uh, who actually had a conversation with the seller, um, and, and he posted a very interesting comment here about even from the pictures. Uh, put up by the broker, you could tell that the workmanship in the airplane was was less than 98. And um, and Tom had talked to the builder, who made a very interesting comment here at the in the end that I put up here at the end. He says, "Why why would someone be willing to spend all that time for something un so unimportant as appearance when they could be flying?" And it's an interesting comment because anybody that's built an airplane or was building an airplane, myself included, you know, you, you have these conversations with yourself all the time about what's more important than what. Um, you know, partly because of your skill set, partly because of, of, you know, what kind of an airplane do you want to build? How, how you know, um, what things you think are, are important. And um, anyway, it, it didn't dissuade me from, uh, uh, picking up the phone finally, and I called the broker. So, so the, the airplane didn't meet the uh, the minimum price, um, the reserve basically on eBay. So it, it it got taken off. But I called the you know the, the the marketing company, and I asked them if I could if I could talk directly to the seller, um, which I did, and um, you know based on representations by the seller. Um, I decided it would be worth a trip to go out and look at the airplane. Uh, my mindset on the airplane was really was most likely going to be something I would buy for parts. And I got the best guy in the in the in the cozy world, Mark Zeitlin, who who built um, a quickie a quickie two, didn't finish it, sold that, and then built uh, a cozy Mark IV. I'd worked for Burt Rutan at Scaled Compo Composites, MIT grad. He's really the, you know, the patriarch in many ways right now of, of the Cozy community. Um, and, and he hosts the CozyBuilders.org, a website, which is the main forum for, for people with this airplane. So um, I asked Mark to come out and do the pre-buy. Um, so we met. Um, on the East Coast, Mark lives in Tehachapi, California. I was in Northern California. We met in, in um, Virginia and went, went to look at the airplane. Mark wasn't, we weren't even in the hangar. We were 20 feet from the hangar. And Mark is like, this airplane shouldn't be flying. And we weren't even in the hangar yet. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, Mark is a very matter of fact person and uh, within a minute or so, you know, talking to the builder, um, the builder kind of sauntered off and, and we had the hangar to ourselves for the rest of the day. Um, so needless to say, um, after Mark looked at the airplane and said, well, look, this is a pretty dangerous cozy, um, but it's got some really high end avionics. It's got a, you know, a superior XPO 360 engine with 150 hours on it. Uh, Mark bore scoped it there, and and uh, we did compression tests and bore scoped it. And and Mark, you know, on the way back to the airport, Mark was, look, if you know, for the right amount of money, uh, you know, it might be worth buying for parts. So I talked to the owner. We negotiated a price, and I'll talk about money. Uh, here in a minute, and um, uh, bought the airplane, uh, for, had to go back to Virginia. I, I put a Sawzall in my, in my bag, and when I got to the hangar, so the airplane had been moved from the seller's hangar over to Phil McClanahan, who was a lo local a and kind of restored airplanes. Uh, he kind of knew about this airplane a little bit. He offered to, to keep the airplane in his hangar, and let me use the, the hangar for uh, a week or two while I sawed off the strakes so it would fit in a box trailer. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and and uh, uh, you know, took the wings off and the canard, and you know, dismantled the airplane enough so we could get the uh, hotshot trucker uh, to uh, take the airplane in a box trailer. So had it hauled all the way back to California. Um, boy, was this airplane in rough shape. Holy mackerel. Um, uh, it had a gear up landing uh, coming back from, from its first trip to Oshkosh. And you can see there, this is, you know, in, in Canard aircraft, you guys know, you know, it has this kind of hokey, uh, you know, nose gear strut. Um, and it's not the most robust uh, item on the airplane, certainly. And, uh, you know, gear up landings are not unheard of. Uh, and when you, when you land on the nose and, and you can see it kind of peeled away a lot of the fiberglass and the strut and part of the attached hardware and it's pretty nasty. And uh, within a couple, the, the, the builder actually repaired this, but not a very good repair. And then, and then had a nose gear separation as well, which was actually reported in the FAA accident report when I did the, you know, did the research on, on this airplane. Um, and, and uh, as part of the title search, um, which also, by the way, is not unheard of in this in this airplane, the the the, the nose gear assembly is basically glued onto the end of that strut, and but it is recommended that you put a bolt uh, through that, you know, um, hardware uh, to help prevent it from separating. It's it's glued and then. And 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 um, pressed between two plates, uh, but anyway, it did separate. So this this airplane it had a, a pretty rough go of it. Um, once I got it back to California, and, and I actually stripped off the naga hide that had been kind of glued against the the rear seat uh, fuselage walls. Um, I mean, the airplane had a strong order odor of fuel the whole time we were, you know, doing the inspection, but we didn't, you know, we didn't get into, we hadn't, hadn't purchased the airplane. So we weren't carrying, carrying pieces off of it. So when I actually pulled off the Naga hide sheeting that was on the sidewall, the, the rear fuselage, uh, there was this incredible amount of fuel staining in there. And, and I put a red circle around the main fuel line that came out of the straight because it actually had a small crack in it. And, and this, this guy had actually flown the airplane in this condition, believe it or not. Um, which is just an, it's just an incredible part of the story to me. It's just how dangerous this airplane was. And, you know, this, this guy was, you know, pretty lucky to be alive in my view. Um, interestingly enough, he had the fuel truck waiting outside of the hangar uh, just in case we thought we might want to take it for a test flight, you know, and we ruled that out before we were, we were even in the hangar. Um, the wings on the Cozy are attached to the strakes with three bolts, half inch. And uh, there's an aluminum hard point here. And this is the inboard hard point on the strake that attaches a wing. And that bushing you see in the lower left-hand corner of that aluminum hard point is supposed to be in the middle. And the interesting thing about it is that that wing attached bushing is actually, part of it is outside of the border of the hard point. And, and that's the, you know, that's the one of the three attachable locations. So you can see if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. So by the third hole, uh, I guess he just decided it was, you know, good enough, um, but, that's a pretty dangerous, pretty dangerous situation. Um, oh, so this was many months after I'd had the project. I finally opened up the Earl's, you know, 40 micron fuel filter uh, with that little sintered brass, you know, filter. And that was the pile of debris that I took out of the filter. And when I, I sent a picture of it to Mark Seitlin and he said, you know, Mark, I've been doing this a long time. I have never seen that much debris in a filter. Um, so that was a little scary. So anyway, um, 
after taking out all the avionics and taking the engine off and taking out anything <laughs> I thought was worth something, um, I cut it up, put it in the trailer, and took it to the Yolo County landfill. Uh, a, a little bit of a funny story there, because I got to the landfill with the title um, showing that I had ownership and that I had canceled the registration with the FAA. And the, the landfill guys were absolutely convinced it was a boat. <laughs> like you're, sh you're showing us a title for an airplane, but it looks like a boat. And, you know, they were being a little, little facetious, I think. Uh, but anyway, we, we managed to get through that. <laughs> and uh, you can see I had the whole place to myself when I, when I pushed it off the trailer. So that was the end of cozy number one. And now I had, you know, again, it, it wasn't my first choice to part out an airplane. It really wasn't where I wanted to start. I kind of wanted to start with something that was a little bit, you know, better and uh, that I could personalize. But I, I ended up sort of taking a chance on it. Um, and uh, so here's what I did with all that stuff. So I gave the guy $30,000 for probably one of the most dangerous cozies that ever flew. It did have 150 hours in the logbook. In spite of the, you know, incredibly poor construction. Um, I paid 2,500 bucks for a hot shot trucker to get it to California. Um, paid Mark Zeitlin to come out and do the pre-buy. Uh, so I had 35000 into it. I ended up selling $15,800 uh, worth of avionics, $6,400 worth of, of kind of cozy related parts and other things that, and by the way, I was shocked at how easy it was to sell this stuff. Um, and you can see, I mean, the avion, he had a Garmin 430 Waz. I mean, this, this guy was Navy trained, you know? I mean, he had a, th th this airplane was, was completely decked out. I mean, he had the Garmin 430 Waz, he had the Aspen EFD 1000, a Trio Avionics Autopilot. I mean, it was, it was very, very handsomely equipped. Um, so I sold $20,000 worth of parts and, and, uh, and that left me for $14,800. $14,800, I, I had basically a brand new engine and all the, you know, all the stuff that goes with it. Um, and I kept, I kept the ICOM A200 radio and the ACK ELT and the JP Instruments engine monitoring system and, and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm telling you, you know, those uh, AeroQuip hose fittings, I ended up with about a dozen of them and they're like you know 80 bucks a piece <laughs> or something so um that was uh so that's what i ended up with so now i have now i have this pile of parts i got no no airframe i still don't want to build the airplane from scratch so i go now i go hunting for an airframe um and you may or may not know about free flight composites, but this is Burl Sanders' company, uh, probably one of the premier uh, canard and composite builder assist, uh, you know, people in the country. He's in Payton, Colorado. Um, he he had done the pre-buy on this uh, cozy airframe. Um, recommended that the the buyer acquire this airframe from the original builder. Um, and then this uh, buyer wanted Burl's company to help him finish it. And the guy ended up abandoning the project. So Burl put it up for sale. And I started looking at it because I thought, okay, now I've got, you know, I got most, I got an engine and I got some avionics and I got a lot of hardware. Uh, if I marry that up with a nearly complete airframe, then I could still, you know, still kind of, you know, massage a little bit. I should have what I want. What I want. So um, I flew to Peyton, Colorado. Uh, spent a day with Burl going over the going over the project. Um, compared to what I had just cut up and taken to the landfill, this thing was immaculate. Um, 
and I could immediately tell the build quality was quite high. And, and, and Burl has a, has a phenomenal reputation in the business. So um, he thought it was a good airplane. Now, he had some things that he thought I should fix and change and gave me a list, uh, which was very helpful. Uh, that airframe was built by a guy named Ray Coons down in Aguilla, Arizona. That's another nice thing about the airframe. It was built, you know, in kind of the perfect climate for a composite airplane where you can kind of, you know, post cure the airplane by just rolling it out into the sun. Um, unfortunately, Ray developed a severe allergy to the epoxy resin, which he, as you know, is one, always one of the risks. So he's got this airframe's like 90% done he can't get near it. So, so Ray ends up selling, selling the project. Uh, the next buyer abandons it. Uh, I buy it. So, so I, another hot shot trucker. Uh, and we get this project to California. Um, and so now I've got you know, I basically, I'm pretty far along. I got an airframe that's basically 90% done. I got an engine. I got some avionics. Heck, I should be able to finish this thing in six months. Um, well, as, as life would, would, would have it, um, you know, my wife and I were kind of at this point in our life where we, we were looking to do something interesting. And I had just sold a company that I'd been running for 12 years built from scratch. And so what do we do? We moved to Puerto Rico. <laughs> so I, I, I put the, the airplane and all the parts up in willows in storage because it's, you know, it's dry and storage is cheap. And, and we go and live in Puerto Rico for four years. And uh, I had a good friend, uh, was running a company there and uh, I was looking for just one more gig before I retired and so I went to Puerto Rico to run this healthcare technology company and uh, we had an amazing time we lived in a we lived in this condominium we still have this condominium um, and it's uh, probably a top easily a top 10 beach in the world there uh, if you haven't been there I recommend it so uh, four years later, I, I, I retire. But what do I do while I'm in Puerto Rico? Well, I have other canard friends that come out to visit me. Uh, and that's, that's always fun. Uh, David Orr and the Bear Coop, which is a, the red and white one on the left, he flew out from Southern California. And Curtis and Chris are from Ohio. And they uh, were looking for a little Caribbean getaway. And they flew their, their canards all the way to Puerto Rico. Um, so when you're flying a desk in the tropics, uh, you know, you, you learn to teach yourself, you know, TurboCAD and you, and you make wiring diagrams and fuel system diagrams and panel diagrams. And uh, I probably put 500, easily 500 hours into just diagramming and cataloging and just, you know, everything that I'm going to do the second I get to work on this thing full time. So uh, I retire uh, mostly because I was just, I couldn't handle COVID and lots of other things, but uh, um, I get the airplane out of storage. I move it into a shop in West Sacramento. Now I'm going to the shop full time, seven days a week, and I'm going to finish this airplane in six months. So that was in, uh, <laughs> that was October of, uh, October of 2020. Um, and, he, and here we are, March of 22. <laughs> We're getting close, though. Uh, so one of the things, you know, uh, one of the things I was interested in doing, because now I, you know, I wasn't feeling like I had to finish the airplane. I wanted to sort of make it my airplane. It was, I did all of the, I started in immediately on all the nice to have sort of features that you can do that are not in the plant. And one of the things with, certainly with composites is, is taking advantage of vacuum bagging. It's a great way to build. Um, so I started with a very simple low vac, basically use a fish, you know, fish tank pump. You can make really small parts. 
I made this little knack duck here uh, in the upper right that I, that I then put in the airplane for the rear seat air vents. So the plans have front seat air vents, but they don't have rear seat air vents. A lot of guys add rear seat air vents. It's a nice little vacuum bag bagging project. So I built rear seat air vents uh, using a simple, this thing doesn't, uh, this, this thing pulls four PSI or five PSI, that's probably a lot, you know? But that, believe it or not, it's amazing. You can see, I don't know if you can see in the right here, uh, there's, a, there's a breather cloth in there, breather bleeder that you put in for vacuum bagging and it's got a lot of resin in it. And it's, uh, it's one of the nice things about vacuum bagging composites. You get the perfect resin to, to glass ratios. So I graduated from the little things like, you know, making a little knack and duck for an air vent to doing something a little bit more sophisticated, making a carbon fiber wheel pants. And, and before, I, before I made my first carbon fiber wheel pant, I made one out of regular glass because carbon fiber is expensive. And I've never made a carbon fiber vacuum bag anything. And I was so happy with the way the, 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 the regular glass one came out, I ended up finishing it anyway. Uh, and then I made the carbon fiber wheel pan. The carbon fiber wheel pan is one pound lighter than the, the regular glass. And any, anything under four pounds for, for these wheel pants is good. The, the regular glass wheel pan is about 3.6 pounds and that carbon fiber wheel pan is about 2.6 pounds. And that's with everything, the hardware, the, the, you know, the main gear, uh, fairing, all in. Um, that's a under three pound wheel pan. Um, so, um, and I used a, basically it's a, it's a diaphragm pump that's used in ventilators. Uh, I'm an old hospital administrator for Sutter Health. And uh, so um, when I was looking for, you know, a, let's say a, not a, a big vacuum pump, just something that'll pull about, you know, somewhere closer to about 12 to 15 PSI, which is really all we need to do this kind of work. Um, I used that gas uh, diaphragm pump. So very affordable, did a great job. Well, I got so excited making carbon fiber things, I just kept going, you know, I made a carbon fiber hoodie. We got a nose door here, you see on the left. So I got a carbon fiber hoodie now and I, and the upper right is carbon fiber headrest and lower right's a carbon fiber um, cover for the uh, speed brake, a motor. It's uh, just an actuator that drives a barn door out underneath the airplane as a speed brake. Um, one of the things that Burl, you know, warned me is that the, the a fill on the airplane was a little thick. Uh, the, the airplane is, was beautifully contoured, but that, the penalty for that is the fill that goes over that final fiberglass layer can get a little thick in places. And Burl thought it was thick. And, and as a matter of fact, he recommended that I remove it in some places and, and replace it with a very thin layer of, of foam and then re-glass re it and then put a thinner layer of fill on. I, I actually tried that in one section of the airplane and that was very painful. Um, and we guesstimated the airplane was about 50 pounds heavier than ideal because of the, the use of fill. Um, and so I set about trying to find 50 pounds an easier way than, than taking all the fill off and, um, and replacing it with a thin layer of foam and then reglassing and refilling. So I just, you know, carbon fiber is, you know, 40 to 50% lighter than the equivalent part in regular glass. And so I, I made a bunch of carbon fiber parts. And so the numbers started adding up. I, I, I redid small things. I redid uh, armrests and center console and probably because of the fill issue, uh, about 25% of the guys that build a cozy have to redo the ailerons because they won't balance. The ailerons only have two plies of glass over foam, uh, but uh, they have to be built very light, otherwise they won't balance. Or you have to put more weight on the leading edge than you, than you want to. So I, uh, these ailerons wouldn't balance. I had to remake the ailerons. I made them out of carbon fiber. I vacuum bagged them. 
uh, they were more than one pound lighter than the original ailerons and they balanced beautifully. Um, so now I, I basically have done all my modifications. I get the main gear, you know, enhanced main gear fairings. I've put in sort of nice to have fence, redid a lot of the fixtures and the inside. Um, I picked up about 35 pounds, believe it or not, just redoing fixtures. Um, and, uh, and then decided to, to go with, you know, lithium ion batteries uh, to get the rest. So I, I was able to get my 50 pounds, uh, just redoing internal fixtures um, and putting in the lithium ion batteries. There's a thousand hours of sanding, even though this air, even though that I did, even though this airplane was almost fully contoured, I put a thousand hours into finishing the contouring, uh, pinhole filling, uh, priming, sanding, re-pinhole filling, more priming. Yeah, I, I, I did nothing but sand and fill from about the end of May 2021 to September. And I was working six to seven days a week. So that a lot of guys abandon these projects at this point because it, it is a brutal, it's just a brutal phase of the project. And there's just no, no two ways about it. Um, so now I got the, you can see one of the things we've got to do is turn the airplane upside down. So we build these big clamshells. We get some friends to roll it over. Um, got the airplane primed, painted the interior with Zolotone 20. Some of you are probably familiar with it. It's a common textured sort of truck bed liner uh, paint. It's pretty easy to spray, very forgiving, covers up a multitude of sand. You don't have to do as much sanding and filling on the internal part of the airplane. Decided to paint the airplane myself. I was in a shop in West Sacramento and, and we had dismantlers on one side and body guys on the other. And I tried, there were two body shops there that painted and I tried to talk both of them into painting my airplane. I brought them over, told them I would, all I need is their gun and their arm. I'd be there with them. Uh, you know, I would have friends turn the airplane over. I, I would, I would bring in a, you know, a trapeze and we'd hang the wings and the canard and all they had to do was shoot it. Couldn't do it. Couldn't get anybody, to, anybody talked into painting the airplane. Um, and of course now I, 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 was, I had found a hangar, so I, I moved the airplane from my shop in West Sacramento to a hangar in Woodland. I, you can't paint in the hangar, uh, so I decided to paint the airplane in my garage. And my wife and I are renting a, a, a three-bedroom house in, in, in Woodland, six miles from the airport. I turned the, the, the garage into a paint booth. Um, in my, in my woodworking world, I used uh, three and four stage turbines. It was really the, 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 the tools and technique that I had the most familiarity with. So I, I elected to paint it. Um, I used a PPG Dell Fleet uh, single stage polyurethane and I painted it with a four stage turbine. Um, and even though I had, you know, professional painters, you know, coaching me and, you know, talking to me about rubbing paint between my fingers and knowing just how much, you know, reducer and, how, you know, how much, you know, air pressure to adjust based on how it feels between your fingers, you know, that's, that's completely out of my league. Um, so um, uh, I, had a, I had, you know, I'd say 30% of the airplane looks amazing another 40 percent's got a lot of orange peel um and uh you know the rest is somewhere between that and uh so i got a lot of color sanding to do uh to make it to really make it you know look showroom or close to showroom but i got enough paint on there that's the key There's plenty of paint on the airplane so and i've, I've tested color sanding so uh, you can see here i propped up the, in order to paint the underside, I had propped up in my garage. So reasonably happy with how the paint came out. Still got a lot of sanding though. I probably have another, you know, 
200 hours of color sanding on the, on the paint <laughs> to really get it where, where it needs to be. Here's my engine. Um, the only metal work I've, I've done on the whole airplane really, I mean, was the baffles. Building that box, the baffle box for the engine was the most, I, I finally had to buy a you know, Harbor Freight bending brake and figure out how to do a rivet. And, uh, and that's really the, the extent of my metal work on, on this whole airplane. Uh, it's, uh, building the baffle box. Um, and then I elected to put in the, the uh, simple digital systems, uh, electronic fuel injection, electronic ignition. So I uh, sold the, you know, magnetos, sold the fuel pump, um, sold the Ellison throttle body, and uh, I've just basically I've pretty much you know, in the last few days have finished that installation. Um, I have all the fuel lines in and the fuel injectors and um, really, you know, excellent uh, quality in the materials. And, and then that's a dual, um, I have the a full dual, you know, engine management computer there. And um, really looking forward to, to how that performs. Um, one of the things about adding fuel injection is you have three more fuel lines to put in. It makes the center console. The plans, the plans fuel selector is actually up against the, 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 the back of the front seat, which is in the upper right-hand corner, uh, is where the plans fuel selector goes. I, um, you know, a lot of guys prefer to put the fuel selector right up where you can see it and you can reach it easily. easily. That, mean, that meant moving the throttle lever back a little bit, um, but it's only a single lever now, uh, no mixture control, and it's a duplex fuel valve. So um, we have right and left, and there's no both in, in this airplane, just right and left and off. Uh, but it does require adding that return line since in a fuel inject, in this fuel injected system, something like 60 to 70% of the fuel actually returns you know, back into the, into the fuel cell. Um, I, uh, I put carbon, I made a carbon, I took the, the plans panel out. It's a bulkhead uh, and, I, and I just took, a lot of guys do this. They take that uh, foam and fiberglass panel out um, and replace it. Most people put aluminum in. I was getting, you know, good at doing carbon fiber. So I, I made a carbon fiber instrument panel. Um, And of course the money shot, you know, everybody wants to know what avionics you got. <laughs> Everybody's been waiting patiently for this, uh, for this one. So I, I, uh, it's funny, I was in a flying club. The company I was running in Puerto Rico had a, we had an office in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I would spend a week, a month up in Charlotte and I joined a flying club there. I had a 182 with, with uh, G5 stacks, the Garmin G5 stack. And, uh, I didn't mention this, but I have, you know, 550 hours and Cessna's, uh, uh, I love the 182. Um, and so I was flying a 182 in a flying club in Charlotte and they had the G5 stack. And I thought, and I kind of, even though I was trained on the steam gauges and did all my, did my instrument, um, did my instrument rating on steam gauges. Um, I was, I got really comfortable with the G5 stack. So I decided to, the equivalent in the Dynon world is the D10 or D6. So I have a, and I'm instrument rated. So I, I, I do plan to fly instruments in this airplane. Um, so, um, and I didn't want to spend a fortune on avionics. So I, I went with a D6 over the top of a D10A. The D10A basically is the HSI and runs the autopilot. This will have a du dual, you know, dual axis autopilot. Um, the, the, the gauge with all the red buttons on it, that's the controller for the EFI EI. So the, and that's really the, you know, tachometer and fuel flow and hell, if you want to go from 25 degrees before top dead center to 26, uh, you can press a couple buttons. <laughs> uh, and then in the, in the middle there is, uh, you know, a, 
PS engineering audio panel and um, the ICOM A200, which I saved from the first airplane and I added a Valcom. And then I, I was hemming and hawing whether to, to get a Garmin, but I, I ended up getting the 175, the Garmin 175. So that's, that's really my, my go-to, uh, you know, GPS approach device. Um, and then just to kind of wrap it up, um, money, you know, it's just, uh, you know, there's, everybody does different math, I think, when they're trying to figure out how much they've spent on building their airplanes. But um, so as you saw earlier, you know, I had uh, between the airframe, I don't think I ended up telling you what I, what I paid for the airframe, but I told Burl it had to be 18,000, including shipping. So he, he had it posted for 19. I told him it had to be 18, including shipping. So we, we settled on like 15.5 for the airframe and then I, I needed a hotshot trucker to get to California. So I was, so I had the original 14.8 plus another 18. And of course I thought I was gonna be done. <laughs> uh, but over the top of that, I ended up spending another $50,000. Um, so I thought, and, I've, and I have been very faithful about tracking it. You know, I'm, I'm not an accountant by nature, but I thought, well, I might learn something along the way. So I have bought over 1,000 unique, I've made over 1,000 unique purchases. Um, you know, while I was in Puerto Rico, I was acquiring some of the avionics and, and, and you can see kind of how I, the, the, the money got spread. You know, um, obviously the equipment was avionics and in the EFI, EI and, not very many items, but, you know, um, you know, a little less than half of the total additional cost. The supplies are big. And, and, and I, I tried to figure out for this presentation, what percentage of that 22,000 I spent in supplies actually went into the airplane, right? Because I got in there are all the, you know, seven mil nitro gloves. I had to buy at Harbor Freight because all the epoxy work I was doing and and you know disposable cups and stir sticks and all that's in there but there's also fiberglass and you know lots of hardware and and what really surprised me was how much i spent on tools i mean i got every crimper known to man i think and i, I probably got you know a thousand of that's just in crimpers so um so it did surprise me just in the end how much i spent on tools and 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 uh, i'm kind of a by the way, I was a stats minor in college, so that's part of why I like this stuff. And uh, you can see in my sort of frequency distribution, no surprise, right? It's not quite a true Pareto, but it's 74% of the thousand unique purchases I made were under $25. So it really, and I think that's one of the things about building these airplanes is you 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 get nickeled in dime, you know, as, and I feel it now, particularly as I'm getting closer to the end, right? Because, uh, you know, when I was working with fiberglass, I only needed four things in the shop. I needed fiberglass, resin, sandpaper, and, you know, a, 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 you know, multi-tool to, to, to trim it. You know, once I got into systems and all the AN hardware and all the pins for the avionics, you know, uh, harnesses and the, the small item uh, volume got, has gotten really high. So um, anyway, I thought maybe that uh, might be interesting to a few people. Um, so I probably went longer than I should have and I apologize, but uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I, and I think I maybe got, uh, cross your fingers, you know, six to eight weeks. Hopefully I'll be fine. And I didn't mention this, but I'll just add it at the end. You know, I know we talk a lot about, are you a builder? Are you a flyer? Are you a builder and a flyer? And I really have been making things, you know, my whole life. And, and I really thought I would be a builder and a flyer. But after, after getting close to finishing this airplane and finishing it, I... I don't really want to build anything anymore <laughs> and I'm going to become a flyer. <laughs>